To get us started this evening, I was going to start with a question to Vince. Could you tell us about how you began writing about dance music in the community and what it was like at the time? Um, I had already been writing about mostly um, music for Rolling Stone and a lot of other smaller publications, mostly black music. I, sort of, I ended up really focusing on R&B. Um, and, and at the same time, in the kind of early 70s, friends of mine took me to the law, uh, a club run by a DJ named David Mancuso, uh, who was really groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Um, and it wasn't just the music that he played, but the people that he brought together that was exciting. Um, his club was a party in a sense and he issued what he called invitations uh, so that people who came knew each other or brought people that they thought would fit in. So it was a very mixed crowd of black, white, gay, straight, um, really lively, really uh, devoted to music uh, and also with a sense that uh, they were hearing music that they hadn't heard before. And certainly that was true for me. I felt like I'd been writing about music for a long time and I thought I knew everything. And to go to a place and hear record after record that I'd never heard before uh, was uh, mind-blowing in a certain way. It really, it made me stop and question you know, where this music came from, how it came together, um, how did he find these records that I'd never heard of before, um, but also how he put them together. Um, and that, for me, was disco, not, not an individual record, but an evening of music, uh, one thing blending into another. Um, and none of the records that he played at that time, there was no, no one called anything by a, a label. So this was long before anyone had a name for this music. It was just music that fit together and created a, an atmosphere throughout the night. <laughs> and it was all, um, it was pre synthesizer too, right? It was all pretty much in, in, the, in the early days. Yeah. I mean, so much early disco came directly from Motown, from Philly International, from other kinds of R&B, but also salsa, African music. Um, a lot of the early DJs played basically whatever they thought worked. Uh, so I remember hearing Bonnie Bramlett at the loft. Uh, a lot, lot of things that later, some, you know, in, in a sense, don't make sense, but the records completely worked. Uh, as long as uh, there was a beat and a break and a, a great vocal, uh, it, could, it could fit. And I remember reading, the book is great, I love it. Thank um, you. And I love reading week by week, but also the interview in the back. But I remember reading... M Manu Dibango had a very a genre like was it kind of a, a a moment that helped to define what was going on when well, that record hit? Well, for me, it did. Um, now I'm blanking out on Manu Dibango, uh, so, Sol, Sol Makosa, yeah, uh, which later uh, Michael Jackson stole for one of his more successful records. Um, Mama Ko, Mama Sa, Mama, Mama, Mama Sa. Um, that record was the sort of hook for my Rolling Stone piece about disco or pre-disco because it came out of nowhere, essentially. It was a completely, you know, left field African record that came out of, actually was broken by a DJ in Brooklyn uh, and picked up by everybody in New York and then became a national hit. And for that record, I knew where that record came from. I mean, I knew that that record came from the clubs. And for that record to get on radio was really phenomenal. Uh, and to be able to sort of trace that record from the clubs to its you know, national hit uh, moment 
gave me the hook that I needed to write that piece for Rolling Stone. Um, because I'd been thinking about this music for a long time. I'd been listening to club music, been going out to clubs, been hearing how it that music started bubbling up at, at concerts and, and the kind of chants that people uh, did in clubs, start, I started hearing them in concerts. Um, and I was really conscious of something underground that was about to break. And I was looking for an, a reason, a way to write about it. And Manu Dibango gave me that excuse gave me that connection. And how long were you going out to the loft and were there other clubs too that you were going to before you wrote the Occasionally, I mean, I, I went to one or two clubs before that, but the loft became my, my regular place. And also because it was the most reliable for me in terms of new, new music. And were, were the friends that took you there, were they gay friends? You, the, you talked a bit, a bit about the diversity. Oh, the, the friends who took me there were a, a, mostly guys that I met who were from Chicago, a, a group of black guys from Chicago who lived in my neighborhood. One of them was a, a sort of part-time DJ. Um, they were all dancers uh, and a girl from Brooklyn who be, was friends of ours. Um, and we would go as a group and to sort of blend into the people who were there. Um, it was uh, it was a time of, of you know kind of really um, discovering for me at least uh, discovering music and discovering a scene that I'd never experienced before. And I um, I tried to capture some of that. If you've been to the exhibition before. It's a this room that we're in is a 50-year history, uh, with one song from each year trying to encapsulate what that year, um, something about that year, and so I start with "Stand" by Sly and the Family yeah. Stone because I, when I was researching for the piece, I knew that that song was actually on the jukebox of the Stonewall Inn. Oh, really? The summer of '69 uh -huh. when the how did you rebellion. find that out? The internet. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is very useful for uh. <laughs> doing research like this. Um, but uh, I was also intrigued by how the music started from, uh, and how the, the clubs and even the gay bars then were more diverse than, I guess, my experience uh -huh. in the 80s where things seemed very sort of segregated. It was either a gay male club or a lesbian club or even a particular type of gay club. Oh, really? Yeah, in Atlanta. In New York, oh. In Atlanta first uh -huh. and then, um, yeah, less so in New York, but even Boy Bar had its crowd. Well, that's true that there were, there were, you know, every club had its own crowd in a sense. A flamingo was much more white than the loft, for instance. Uh, but I think that it was also, there was generally this sense of being with a community, uh, whether, you know, no matter how mixed or unmixed it was, it was about celebrating with people that you related to. And did you become the expert on this scene immediately because of this Rolling Stone article? In a sense, yes. Uh, I hadn't thought, no one had asked me that quite that bluntly before. <laughs> but, uh, but no one else was, was paying attention. That was my feeling. No one, hardly anybody else was writing about um, R&B or black music anyway. Um, so this was music that was, for the most part, when I first started writing about it, was completely under the radar. Very little of it was on the radio. Uh, it was, uh, there was this incredible uh, sense of uh, attachment to the music because it was ours. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, and often as soon as the, a record broke out of the clubs and got on the radio, the DJ stopped playing it because it had, it had gone. Uh, there was something else new to play anyway. Um, but there was the sense that this was our music 
uh, and that was it came out of this you know this community in a sense and it was in a way it was kind of a, a secret or a, a private language for a in while. a sense but I, it wasn't it certainly wasn't upsetting when these records became huge hits that was exciting too uh, it was great that people could relate to the, all that music uh, and that it that Gloria Gaynor became a hit, that, um, uh, that Barry White became a hit, that all these, all these things that had bubbled up in the clubs became huge records, uh, and that there became disco radio stations at some point. Uh, all these things, um, you know, made a difference. One of the things I loved about reading in the book, as you go week by week, is you could see actually the development of some of the records as they became more popular uh, in right. the clubs uh, because you, you, there's a narrative but you also show the charts from various DJs that you would call which, which I think is great too, it wasn't based on sales, it was based on you it was based on talking me, right, yeah. to DJs. It was based on me calling DJs who were often not even awake you know, during the day. Uh, so it was me putting together uh, a group of people who I could rely on uh, and who I really trained in a way. I mean, I, I was very strict with them that they weren't to hype me. Uh, I didn't want to hear about the, you know, I did want to hear from them about the latest records that they liked, what they were excited about. But I didn't want that to be their number one record because I knew it wasn't. I, I wanted to know what they were really playing and what people were actually responding to. And so that's what the list was based on. Because I'd, for me, it had to be legitimate. I didn't want them to tell me about all, their, all the things that they'd just gotten. Uh, although I wanted to know about that too. So you wanted to know what people were responding to and what they were dancing to? And what they were actually to. dancing to. What people were screaming for. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. And so little by little, that's what I got from them. And that's what enabled me to put together what I thought was a legitimate list. And w when I started making this body of work in the late 80s, the way I found out about it was by doing research at Lincoln Center Library and looking at microfiche of Billboard magazine. But I, I read about, they, kind of, they stole your methodology. They... <laughs> Their, uh, that's how they did their dance yeah, charts right. too, uh, calling DJs calling around people. the country. Right, yeah. Well, it was the only legitimate way at that point. There was, you know, there was no other way to know. There wasn't, you couldn't do sales. Uh, and, uh, and that would have been a whole other way of, you know, tracking, but. Well, later it became that and yeah. the, the whole industry yeah, changed clearly, right. in, in the 80s uh -huh. when that happened. Um, did you have a question for us? I do have a question <laughs> for you. You had talked about a little bit ago pre-disco. What separated pre-disco into disco? What was the turning point? It, it, it really was when people started putting a name on it. Um, and it was at a point when um, it became commercial. It became a, you know, a radio uh, play. So and it, it, it enabled the record labels to uh, figure out how to, um, how to promote it, for one thing. Um, but also, I mean, the problem was at the very beginning that there were a number of, of successful formulas that became so um, like beaten to death within a, a year that I was worried that disco was over almost before it really get, went anywhere. But what was always great about disco was that it was always a kind of outsider craziness. There was always some new person who would take it somewhere different, take it somewhere outside what it was already. So, and disco was very uh, open to all of that, open to some somebody from uh, a other realm completely uh, and and that's I think what kept it 
lively and kept it going and kept it legitimate for me uh, because they managed little by little to avoid any formula and create something surprising. One of the one of the records that I think did that that you trace over the summer uh -huh. when it first comes out and then as it becomes more and more of a juggernaut is the album by Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah yes. band. Yes. Yeah. I was that's my that's the perfect example. Uh, completely off the wall, wonderful record. No, like nothing else around. Really smart, really interesting. Not uh, not disco in any way, but a completely danceable record. I mean, I guess you know my dis my definition of disco is is something really open ended. Nothing. I mean. In the end, a lot of people, what people think of as disco is Donna Summer, is Euro disco, and uh, something thump, 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 and that's it. Uh, and disco from the beginning was much more broad, much more unexpected, uh, much more unpredictable, uh, and much more off the wall like Dr. Buzzard, something that, that sounded like old music but was completely contemporary and smart. It's a, it's a, it's still a great album. If you want to, pick Dr. It up. Buzzard's original Savannah band. <laughs> sure, Shay Lafemme. Yeah, is, uh, a, a classic, one of the an best known. off, off the wall classic. So that makes me want to ask Stephen a question about <laughs> what really brought you into the work you're making here and that you've been making over your career. Is there a cohesion between the early music that you're looking at? And later music, it's, you have 50 years here. Is there? Mm. Do you feel disco throughout this piece? I guess the the cohesion here is. I think it's um, the songs here are sort of owned by the community in the same way that Vince was talking about earlier. Because you have um, as the piece progresses and you get closer to the present in time, you have songs like "Rules and Regulations" by Rufus Wainwright, which is not a dance song, but it's about identity and constriction and, you know, the rules uh, that are put on, put upon us by society. Um, and so I think the music, it comes from my viewpoint, which is as a gay man, but I, I like to leave it open for everybody to enter it because we all have ideas about these songs, the ones that we know, we definitely have specific memories about. Um, Do you really want to hurt me? Might remind you of a particular, you know, that's not really a dance song either, but we all know it, uh, the Culture Club song. And it might remind somebody of a relationship or, or a, a great year or summer that they may have had. Um, so I started making it to sort of identify a particular time period when I, the first couple of pieces I made were about the moment in which I was living. One was called Late 80s Playlist, and it was songs from two or three years in the late 80s when I had just moved to New York, and it was about uh, celebration, but also fear, uh, because we were facing... HIV and the AIDS crisis and uh, various sort of social strife that um, that we're always going through in a way and um, when I think back about how it came about I um, I think about listening to the radio when I was a teenager and uh, I was really really into disco um, uh, but into a, a lot of other musics as well um, but or genres, I, but I, I loved it. And um, I went, uh, I was lucky to go to boarding school on a scholarship. And um, I felt like an outsider there. But I remember this particular time, there was, um, through music, I connected with people. One night, they used to show films every weekend, and one night, The Sound of Music was showing, and we were all homesick kids, where, whatever our background was. Um, mine was working class, my dad was in the Navy for 30 years. But 
that movie was showing and we all started singing along to all the songs and I felt really connected and a, a part of a community. And then later there was a school dance there and um, they were playing uh, I Feel Love by Donna Summer and people, the students really liked it. Everybody was dancing. The same and people who liked it. Sound of Music? Yeah. <laughs> It was a hip school. <laughs> this is interesting. It was uh, ex Exeter in New Hampshire. Uh, oh. And, uh, but we were, you know, I remember like we were dancing and uh, I felt like, oh, this is so great. Everybody's dancing to this and everybody uh, is into this thing I'm into and I, I didn't feel so separated. But then about halfway through the song, the DJ took the needle and scraped it across the record and it went <laughs> then he stopped for a beat and then he put on My Sharona by The Knack <laughs> which is a total you know, new <laughs> right. wave rock and roll and the kids went wild and then I totally I became deflated immediately because I, I uh, you know realized I'm not totally a part of the community even though I like that song uh. but but there was, you know, this was that this was around shortly before the big record burning in Chicago oh, oh. when all the the DJ got oh. all, everybody to burn their disco records. Oh. So this the, kind of juxtaposition of songs, I think, I, I thought back to that later on that that may have been part of this. That um, it's like smell, right? Music is uh, and songs. If you have a memory for it, it's like smell. They it's really strong and it can be a really really strong mnemonic <clears throat> and um and for me at least it is well and so much you know how how we identify with songs and relate to sp particular songs that, that identify us um uh, so well, in that sense Shall we? <laughs> you first. Because, um, uh, you know, I've thought about this off and on. It's like the, the voices that I remember hearing first and, and being moved by in, in clubs were usually women. Uh, as, as the first groups that I remember dancing to at, at the loft were First Choice, Ecstasy, Passion, and Pain, all these sort of new wave girl groups, in a sense. Uh, and then Donna Summer, Gloria Gaynor, um, all the great voices. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I don't have a theory about that. I think it's uh, it was easier to... Uh, I don't know how to put this. I feel like um, women were leading the way in this kind of music and there certainly were male voices there was sylvester later although that's a little bit of somewhere in between but at the beginning there were tramps there was harold melman and the blue notes there was all this there was quite a blend uh, so i never felt like the women totally ruled uh, but they certainly had a, a power in disco that that extended beyond that little room and I think that's a lot of what what people outside of those of the clubs picked up on too. Uh, the first voices that people understood as sort of bringing this music uh, to a larger audience. Yeah, I I think it's a lot to unpack, um, and I think it's related to um, gay men's love of opera as well, and. Um, and also, I think, a tradition of living within very rigid gender boundaries for most of the 20th century, and it being a way to sort of freely express, you know, to sort of um, embody the song, like I'm Coming Out by Diana Ross, to like live within that song if you're uh, a gay person and um, uh, maybe try some way that maybe at, 
a time it was a way to express the fullness of your sexuality or the you know 360 degrees of your the way you identify you dealt with gender uh, so I, I, I mean for that, me that's I, that's you know I can understand that I, I have no relationship to opera and I think most of the men that either, I but okay <laughs> so I think most of the guys that I grew up with could really did not relate at all but I came from Mary Wells uh, from Motown from all the those Martha and the Vandellas, Martha and the Vandellas. Great. Uh, so it was the the girl groups that led that were some of the first kind of pre disco uh, songs. Uh, so it kind of that was a, you know the Ronettes. It all kind of came together in in the clubs. But I love a you know I love a great male voice too. Uh, and Freddie Mercury and Elton John were also early True. role models. Yeah. And then there were lots of, on the flip side, there were a lot of, in, in the disco scene, there were a lot of very macho singers, right. too, who right. came along. Uh -huh. And then Sylvester's lovely, because... Uh -huh. uh, Sylvester, Sylvester was Sylvester unique. Was, yeah. does, does anyone know who we're talking about, Sylvester? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Someone who was really sort of early in the gender fluidity, and but with the most the wonderful voice, great music, uh, great performance, uh, but you know was really out there in terms of uh, performing as uh, somewhere in between genders. And his backup band was Two Tons of Fun. <laughs> which later became known as the Weather Girls, oh. who sang It's Raining Men, uh, which inspired that piece on the other side yeah. of the wall. Um, yeah, Sylvester was great. And he worked with one of the great uh, musical geniuses of the genre, who was Patrick Cowley. Patrick Cowley. Cowley uh, there was a lot of background. I mean, a lot of the people behind the scenes were super important. I mean, and, it was one of the ways that I think rock and roll people dismissed disco as a perform as a um, uh, something that was that came out of production rather than performance. But I think that they were, you know, they equally they were linked and in a good way. Somehow lesser than, right? You know, yeah. Um, can can I? Do you have another question? Because I have many questions. But I go ahead. <laughs> well, there's one thing that I marked in the book um, that I I wanted to ask you about, Vince, which yeah. is uh, in May of '76 uh, you wrote um, and you uh, can can I read from it a little bit? Um, Be my guest. You have two quotes that start your article that week. One of the most fascinating allurements of city life to many a young girl is the dance hall, which is truly the anteroom to hell itself. <laughs> Here indeed is the beginning of the white slave traffic in many instances. A girl may in her country home have danced a little, but here, mid the blazing lights, gaiety, and the so-called happiness she enters, she is told she is awkward and will become more graceful. No harm in it. You know the rest. And then the next quote uh, says, These dance halls have brought to this neighborhood the truly evil people who work New York. Their operators prey upon the innocence of people in the community as well as on our society. There is nothing wrong with dancing and there is nothing wrong with music, but these places have nothing to do with either. And then you uh, further wrote, the first of these two righteous statements printed above comes from a book called Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade, the Greater Crime in the World's History, which was issued in 1910. The second is taken from an editorial in a New York paper called the Soho Weekly News and dated May 13th, 1976. <laughs> Thank and you. I completely love that. Well, I, I, I always you pointed it out. Yeah, I'm always, you know, I was interested, particularly in in this controversy, because that editorial I think had quite a lot to do with David Mancuso opening his club in Soho, um, at, and bringing a group of people to Soho that 
uh, the people living there already were really not prepared to deal with. Um, no matter how well behaved they were, uh, they were black and Latin for the most part, and they were young, and, and Soho was fairly totally white and older. It really upset them, uh, and they really went on a, a kind of crusade against the club. Uh, which did eventually open and was quite successful, but they, it was a real tension in the city. And I guess just, I felt that they were being, you know, righteous in a way that, that, uh, that I connected to that earlier attitude. And I think a lot of that was coming, I mean, the art world was centered there yes. at the time, right? I mean, I don't think, you know, I, I wouldn't accuse the art world, but there, that was... It, it was people who did come along with that. Right. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that you took that up in a... Well, I had become at that point very space. very much involved in, um, in club life and I really, you know, kind of an, a true advocate for it. And I didn't... I really felt that there was a lot of prejudice going on, um, really obvious, uh, that was really you know, out of control. So you both are kind of touching on the fact that there's an evolving community around disco, the clubs, dance music, and can you each speak to your own experiences of how it evolved, like in the 70s, 80s, 90s, for each of you? Because I'm very curious your personal experiences. Obviously, it's impacted Stephen's artwork and uh, your writing has been uh -huh. centered on it. It's, it's hard to answer that because I, I essentially stopped going out as much uh, at a certain point after after the column was over, after I sort of stopped working at a record company. Um, I After the loft, I went pretty regularly to a club called the Paradise Garage uh, with a DJ named Larry Levan who was very influential in a lot of ways. Um, and all those clubs, all the clubs that I went to were similar in that they were essentially uh, black and gay, uh, but very open to everybody, uh, and, and men and women. Uh, I really was not interested in going to a club that was just men. Uh, and and the, that kind of openness uh, was not... Um, evident er everywhere, I have to say. Uh, and for me, one of the, Studio 54, although, you know, iconic as a club, uh, was for me the beginning of the end uh, because of the whole door policy there was really um, so exclusionary. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily about ex excluding a particular type of person, it was just I didn't like the idea of the velvet rope. Uh, and, um, and there was something so elitist about it that it became, uh, and the idea that it became the club was uh, a real, really problematic to me. So there, at the same time, there are all kinds of other clubs going on and successful. Um, but it did, things did change little by little, and certainly AIDS changed quite a lot. Uh, and, and there was a lot of, um, I think probably you can talk to that better than I can. And for me, it, it was a place to find community. Um, and uh, I, the first time I went out to a club was in Charleston, South Carolina, when I was, pro I was probably still 17. And, um, and then later I moved to Atlanta to go to art school and I went out a lot there. There was a 24 seven club there called Backstreet, which uh, had everybody um, and it, it became a very famous club. And there's even a Facebook page called I Partied at Backstreet <laughs> that has a lot of members. Um, and that was, a, that was a really interesting place. You know, it was a kind of place where Bette Midler would Play and Grace Jones would play, and so it was um, a center for the community in Atlanta. Um, and uh, later, a kind of a new wave gay club called Weekends opened, and that became 
our hangout for the art school kids and you know we'd go out dancing on weeknights when we had painting crits the next day and we had to <laughs> should not have been out dancing um, and then when I got to New York you, um, yeah it had changed quite a bit in, in those from the early 80s to the late 80s um, in, in the interim I was in Canada there was one big club uh, in Halifax so um, going out then became also sometimes a political activity like going to see Jimmy Somerville of Bronski Beat uh, doing a benefit for ACT UP um, which he did at Palladium uh, I remember that show very specifically um, and uh, he, he, everything changed everything changed um, but what, what was interesting is how there was always dance music on the radio WBLS right. always was playing dance music and um, even though there was that big record burning in Chicago in the early 80s dance music never went away and now uh, almost everything you hear on current pop uh, radio if you still listen to radio um, has some kind of influence from dance music so it, it, it took over in a way, very quietly, <laughs> yeah. over a long well, period I mean, of time. It, it, clearly, one of the, the key things in terms of the business was that d uh, disco essentially was primarily black music. So for the first time in a long time, uh, it meant that a lot of the, the records on, at the top of the charts were by black performers. And, um, and I think that was one of the reasons why there was that backlash uh, a lot of rock and roll performers were kind of shut out or at least sort of kept down on the charts and were not happy about that. And a lot of the uh, are in, uh, sort of old-time rock DJs at radio were not happy about that. Um, but disco was really groundbreaking in that way. It brought a lot of black performers to the charts and a lot of them became you know, successful for many years afterward. And Donna Summer being a great example. And it was also a place where uh, you, there could be out gay performers or yeah. artists that are uh -huh. catering to that audience. Right. You were talking earlier about um, Born uh, This Way by Lady Gaga as referenced in the piece. Right. You said there was an earlier song. Yeah, uh, a song called Born This Way by uh, a black performer named Valentino, who I don't think went on to doing too many other things, but he did a, a song as an out gay man, uh, singing Born This Way, that was quite successful, uh, at least at the club level, uh, and that memorable, memorable early out record. Yeah. Exciting. So we're starting to get close to our time for conversation, but I do see questions and hands starting to pop up in the audience. Are you up for some questions? Sure. <laughs> as long as they're not rude. Yes. This, could, I haven't thought about them in years, but could you talk a little about record pools and how they evolved and how, they was, how central they were to knowing? Record pools started because as disco DJs became more and more um, uh, needy, in a sense, and became more uh, important to the record labels, uh, they, they still found it hard to get records from record labels. Uh, it became, uh, how, how, do they, how do they prove themselves as actual DJs? So the record pools formed in, first in New York and then in almost every other major city as a way to, for the DJs to come together and uh, sort of legitimatize themselves. Uh, and, and, and the pool itself would receive the records and then distribute it to the DJs. So it became a way for the, the labels to uh, not to have to deal with DJs who would sort of show up at their office saying, can I have something? Uh, instead, they would deliver it to a central place and the DJs would pick it up from there. But 
I think this is partly, largely because um, one of the things that the DJs had in their favor was that they were breaking records. They were playing records that no one else was playing, and they were, and those records were little by little becoming hits on the radio. So the companies, the record companies, realized they had a whole other way of promoting things that avoided radio, but eventually sort of bubbled up to radio. And that was, that was why they actually started paying attention to DJs, because they realized they were um, selling records, they were getting records played, that people would show up the day after they heard a record in a club at a record store and want that record. So um, it was, they became a whole other way of um, breaking records, uh, of you know, promoting records, uh, and they became very important for a good period of time. That was, that was why the pools got formed. But because the clubs were like an alternative network as opposed to the radio stations, right. the people that ran the record pool knew who the legitimate DJs were. Right, They yes. knew who to distribute yeah. them to. So, yeah, that was, again, sort of inside, but... <laughs> well, that makes me curious. Was it a very collaborative nature among the DJs at this time, or was it a bit competitive to see who could... A, a, a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, having done the the column that I did, it, what I realized quickly was what an incredible grapevine there was going on among DJs. That they knew each other, they shared things with one another, um, they talked often, you know, a DJ in New York would talk to a friend in LA or Miami and hear what they were playing. They were, you know, fiercely competitive because they wanted to be the first person to play something, but once they had it, they were excited to talk about it. So there was an incredible grapevine among the DJs. Uh, and, and that really, I think, it made hits happen very quickly. If something was, if, if somebody really liked something, everybody knew about it quickly. Can you tell us what a white label was? <laughs> Again, another sort of insider thing. But white labels, which really were, um, sort of throughout the business were pr early promotion copies, uh, often with a handwritten uh, title on the label, that were very valuable to DJs or to anybody uh, collecting because they were often, usually the first copy of something that would appear uh, long before it was pressed for, for commercial purposes. And so that would be kind of exclusive yes. to, to whoever well, had it. I mean, that's how the whole DJ thing kind of got crazy and out of hand in a good way sometimes because it was very, people wanted to be the first person to have that record. And if the, the record companies were co going around with white labels, uh, that was exciting. That was kind of an you know, exclusive thing. If the record didn't work, it had no value. I mean, that was, the, I think that was the other thing that record companies realized, that they could take a record to a club, and if it cleared the floor, it was over. Uh, if, it, if it was a success, they knew right away. Or if, they, if it needed work, they could tell that. Uh, it was a way to test something um, really quickly. Uh, and, you know, know that if it needed work, they, they had to go back. But if it was a success, they knew it immediately. And, uh, and then other DJs were dying to have that record. <laughs> yeah. In the early years of this show, how did the DJs get that music? What was the They went to record stores. Mm -hmm. They went, they, and they really, they went everywhere. Uh, they really, uh, there were a number of stores that were, that really um, focused on dance music. Um, and so there were a number of stores, especially at least in New York, that DJs went to regularly. Uh, but they bought records. They spent money on records. Um, they sp often spent more money than they made at the beginning. But that was their passion. Um, so, and 
and again, it was very much word of mouth, but, but really they, they went to stores. That was, there was no other alternative. I, at the time that that happened, I was working at a record a record store at Tower at the first Tower Records in New York. I'd been through, I'd already been at a record label for two years. I ended up at the, as a buyer uh, for disco dance music at that point, um, and R and B at, at Tower, and almost all the the kids who came in to buy records were into new wave. Uh, and almost all of that was danceable. Uh, early, a lot of new wave records were completely danceable and they were great. So I didn't feel like, for me, there was, this was all dance music. But how did punk then figure into that? There was, uh, it didn't so much. I, I didn't really, I never absorbed punk. Uh, sorry. Uh, but, I, but new wave was so, was so much a part of of what people were dancing to and listening. Uh, and it felt like a continuation. I mean, for me, as long as you can dance to it, it doesn't need to be disco. It doesn't need to be labeled. Did the black community kind of signal the new wave as well? Somewhat, somewhat. As long as it was really a, a great record. Um, early New Order, I mean, um, they're, they're just irresistible songs. The first time I ever heard Kraftwerk, and it was the song Numbers, was played on the black radio station in Charleston, South Carolina. And the first time I ever heard Planet Rock was <laughs> that first time I went to a gay club in Charleston. So there was a lot of crossover, yeah. I think, at the time. Yeah, I think a lot of barriers broke down uh, over the, the 70s and early 80s. Um, and there was less and less a sense of this stops here. It was really very open, at least ideally. I think it's a lot easier for me because you know you have history, so you know what became a big hit or what was reflective of what the community was going through or what resonates for you personally for, you know, throughout the years. Like, Small Town Boy by Bronski Beats, an incredibly important song. It's a song about a, a young gay man coming out, leaving his hometown and moving to London, and, you know, dramatized in a video that was a huge part of MTV. And, um, but it never went away. It made such an impact, and it's a, such an important song. So, for me, I think it's, easier what i was fascinated you know when we were talking about dr buzzards uh -huh. i was fascinated by how quickly you recognize that was a major record and a major contribution to uh -huh. the field and i i think that's i think that that was about your passion and you were just so tuned in to what was going on hopefully yes yeah i mean that's that's how i you know how I did that column, I really felt if I wouldn't have done it had I not been completely immersed in that music uh, and, and cared about it myself and played it constantly at home. So I don't know that I can answer your question, though, in particular. I didn't quite understand how, what you were asking me. One of the things that I get from reading people like Tim Lawrence or even like Douglas Crimp, um, they talk about how these clubs were kind of, some of them were just in like apartments. Well, the loft was. Like, the loft was, yeah, in somebody's loft at the beginning.
Yeah, it really has to be. I mean, I was excited at the in the moment. In the moment, it's you know, I didn't. For me, it didn't need to last. It didn't. I wasn't expecting this club to go on forever. It wasn't important. It was important that it was happening then. Um, and and a lot of clubs have more impact no matter how long they lasted. It really is the, a club, an early club that. Uh, that I often talk about called Tenth Floor. Do you know that was mentioned? Well, I, ne I never had the pleasure, yeah, it but was, I loved reading about it. And it was an early club that was completely anonymous. That was very much a, a small membership club. Uh, that was literally on the tenth floor of an office building that you wouldn't know was there unless you knew. Um, and it didn't last for very long, but it was mentioned in Dancer from the Dance. Uh, as a significant place. Uh, it was a key early gay club that also the design of it was picked up on almost every other major gay club afterward. Um, it didn't matter that it didn't last more than two years. Uh, it was influential in its time and and it seemed, it was a great place. It was really, uh, it was interesting in the way it was set up and the music was great. This was all totally pre-disco. All mostly, pe they were playing vinyl 45s. Uh, so that place remains historic for me because uh, if it's even if it didn't have a lot of impact beyond a small audience, that audience was a key audience in New York, uh, and and that kind of resonated for a lot of reasons. And then I think community was incredibly important to it. You you often write about the community's response to a particular song yeah. within the column. Uh -huh. No, it's true. It was really, there was this sense of people coming together around the music, relating to it in a really intimate way. Uh, and I think that's what what made disco important for people who, who went out long before uh, it was popular, long before it was a phenomena. Uh, it was very important to the people who, who went to clubs. It really defined a lot of people's lives. Uh, and um, I, mean, I think a lot of people remember it as a period when they could celebrate with people that they didn't even know, um, that they could dance you know, together. And I'm sure that still goes on. I hope it still goes on. Uh, it's not something um, I, you know, I, I don't go dancing in the way that I used to. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Well, for me, it, it's, uh, I've already kind of made that decision. It, it was the record that, that we were playing as people came in, uh, MFSB's Love is the Message. The title alone says a lot. Uh, it's essentially a, an instrumental, but with some uh, vocals mixed in. Um, it's a long symphonic song with lots of breaks. It became, for me, the disco record. It was the record that was played at Larry Levan's memorial. It was the record that people screamed when it came on. And it's the, it's the record that still moves me. Because even it has no, it's not about the lyrics, it's about the emotion of the song. And, and that kind of, for me, 
is one of the things that the disco did. It was about the music, it was about the breaks, it wasn't necessarily always about the lyrics or the vocals. Uh, it was about the spirit of the music. Um, and so to hear a really symphonic, like six minute instrumental uh, that drove people crazy when it went on, that's, that's the song for me. That's the one that comes to, my, to mind immediately. There are so many for me, it's, it's hard to pick one, but <clears throat> you know, Vince and I, when we were talking about this, this program tonight, we decided we'd play, he'd, we'd do an introduction song that he would choose, and that was Love is the Message, and then we'd do an outro that uh, I'll put on momentarily, but it's, d despite Morrissey's recent antics, my song <laughs> of choice tonight, <laughs> is there is a light that never goes out um, because of its uh, lyrical resonance and the great music and the spirit of it uh, about um, finding community and finding love. And so the lyrics of the song, they, they move me a lot, are um, take me out tonight um, be because I wanna see people and I wanna see life. And then later in the chorus, it says, um, if a double-decker bus crashes into us, to die by your side is a heavenly way to die. And I just think that's <laughs> amazing. Uh -huh. so. well, join me in thanking Stephen and Vince. And thank you all for joining us.